how many of you have ever found yourself on one of these at some point in time in your life? Let me see the hands. How many of you have ridden a seesaw? Yeah. Maybe it was at the neighborhood playground. Maybe it was with your sweetheart. Maybe it was with your kids or with your grandkids. If you look at this particular picture, it's not hard to realize that there's something missing here, right? What's missing? Yeah, a second person, right? A second person is missing. And this little girl's not going to have the full seesaw experience unless there's another person involved. See, her experience depends on the presence of somebody else. I wonder on this Mother's Day weekend, how many of us would say that when our lives have become kind of grounded like she is, and we need some help to, to get our lives flying again, how many of us would say that we either have called on mom or we call on mom pretty regularly? You out there? You know what I mean? Happy Mother's Day, my friends. Now, I have this crazy story I need to tell you. We had intentions of giving every one of the ladies that Paula talked about a beautiful carnation at the end of the service today. We had them ordered, and it was all set and ready to go. And then on Friday afternoon late, we got word that the carnations that we were intending to give to you were coming from Columbia and they were stuck in customs in Memphis, Tennessee. Now I got to tell you, I've heard a lot of stories in 40 years, but none quite like that. But it's the truth. Guess when they're going to show up? Monday morning. A lot of good that's going to do us. But just know, ladies, we love you, and we are so thankful for your presence in our lives. We are who we are in large part because of you guys. You know, mom's the one that tends to be the go-to person whenever there's a, a need in life or um, whenever something happens, and, and mom dro usually drops what she's doing and she goes to take care of the need. And then, of course, when she comes back to the things that she was doing, well, there's either not enough time to do it or what she was doing has to be compromised. Can I get a witness, ladies? You know what I'm talking about? I, I don't know how many times I'll come home from the office and Betsy will say, I just got home myself just a few minutes ago. She might have been out taking care of the kids or taking care of the grandkids, running the kids someplace like that. And, and then she'll follow up that comment with this. Well, uh, because I just got home a few minutes ago, I haven't had time to make anything for dinner, so we're going to have to order out. You know, I think she does that on purpose, actually. I think she does it on purpose so that we will just order out more. Then there are those moments in a mom's life, and this has happened to Betsy a time or two, when somebody calls on mom for need of some kind, and mom kind of uncharacteristically responds something like this. Look, a lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. You out there, moms? You, you know what I'm talking about? Or to say it another way, your failure to do what you need to do will not get in the way of me doing what I need to do. Ah, those... Moments are rare, probably, but they are there. And then there are those times in our lives when we absolutely do need somebody else to be able to care for the things that we need in our lives. That there's no way the needs that are in our life at a particular moment are going to be cared for unless somebody else comes into our situation and helps us. If you want to put it in slang terms, it would be this. If you don't do your thing, I can't do my thing. Think about some examples of that. If you promise to take me to my doctor's appointment and, and you don't arrive on time to pick me up, 
I can't arrive on time for my doctor's appointment. Right? Make sense? Or if the landlord decides not to pay the gas bill one month, the tenant doesn't have hot water, can't cook, can't shower, doesn't have any heat maybe. Paula will tell you that if I don't give her the, the message themes in a good enough advanced time, it's difficult for her to plan worship. If you don't do your thing, I can't do my thing. Just think about the newspaper. Some of you get the, the printed newspaper. If, it, if the delivery person fails to put it on your porch or put it in your driveway, well, you can't read the paper, right? If you don't do your thing, I can't do my thing. God structured the church like that. The way the church works is that every one of us needs to do our thing so that the church can be what God wants it to be. It's kind of like it's difficult for me to, to give my unique gifts to the life of the church if you don't give your light your unique gifts. If my giving is compromised, when you choose not to give your particular gifts to the life of the church. Or, as the great theologian who is part of our church staff, Vaughn McCommons, said this week at staff meeting, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it keeps me from doing what I'm supposed to do. That's good God's country theology right there. If you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it keeps me from doing what I'm supposed to do. So we've been talking the last couple of weeks about 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've spent some time walking through the, about the first half of 1 Corinthians 12 over the last couple of years. How about, a, how about a word of appreciation for Alex and the wonderful message that he shared with us last week? Well done, Alex. Thank you, brother. Thanks for being faithful. And he kind of took us up to about the halfway point through 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In the latter half of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about this that we've been talking about. If you're, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it keeps me from doing what I'm supposed to do in the life of the church. So I want to read through this, these verses. And I'm going to stop a time or two to just circle a couple of things for us to realize. Okay, So Paul says this, starting in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. Just as a body, the one has many parts. But all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles or slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Now, I'm going to stop there a minute. I want us to remember that the giftedness that each of us has the uniqueness that each of us has, has its root in Jesus Christ. Every one of us, our giftedness is rooted and connected, finds its meaning by being connected to Jesus. We were all given the one spirit, the one and same spirit. All of our gifts come from the same place. Now let's watch how it unfolds. Paul says, even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body. God has placed the parts in the body. Every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. I'm going to stop a minute and circle the fact that every person, every gift that is given to you all is essential in the life of the church. We've been talking about being part of the gifted class. We're all part of that class. 
And every one of us in that class has been given some gifts that are essential to the life of the church working the way God intended it to be. An eye can't do a, a nose's job. An ear can't do a, 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 an eye's job. Every person, every gift has been put into the body exactly as God designed it to be. Don't miss that fact. All of our gifts find its root and its source in Jesus. And God has put every one of us in the church with gifts the way God desires it to be. Now let's, let's finish it up. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together. Would you say that with me? But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Because see, if one part suffers, then every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, then every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ. And every one of you is a part of it. So the gifts are rooted in Jesus Christ. They are given and placed in the life of the church just as God desires it to be. And every one of them is essential. From the, from the most present the gift that shows up the most to the one that is seemingly the least significant. Every one of those gifts are essential in the life of the church. Let me, let me get you to look at your hand for just a minute. How many of you would say that there's a weaker digit on your hand? Which, which is probably the weakest digit? This is the interactive part. Which is the weaker digit? Probably the pinky, right? You ever tried to do something you really need to do without your pinky? I mean, it gets to be complicated, doesn't it? It's hard to play guitar without a pinky finger. It's hard to play piano without a pinky finger. The finger that everybody circles and says that's the weakest is still essential. We had a great example of this just last night in Pittsburgh at the Pirates game. I mean, the new guy had a great outing, didn't he? How many baseball fans we got out there? Can I, can I see? Yeah. So the new guy had a great outing. Six to one. And then the relief pitchers came in and proceeded to walk seven batters in a row. And a bunch of runs came in. And it was a tied game when the rain delay started. And all of us who have followed the Pirates for a long time said to ourselves, that's it, they're done. But after the rain delay, the bats woke up, and a couple of people hit some home runs. And this baseball team <laughs> that had walked all these runs in ended up winning the game. Why? Because it was a team effort. You see? Every part of it's essential. When one part of it suffers, the other parts suffer with it. We are together. And think about this. If, if what I'm suggesting to you is true, that God has in fact arranged this body just like He wants it to be and has put gifts in every one of you, for you to say that you don't have a gift or for you to compare your gift to somebody else and say, because my gift isn't like that, I'm not going to give my gift. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying, God, you must have made a mistake when you gave me my gift. Because my gift is not like somebody else's. You must have made a mistake. So I'm just going to sit on my gift. Can I tell you God doesn't make mistakes? Can I tell you that the gift you have is exactly the gift that God wants you to have? And we as a church are not going to be what God wants us to be without every one of us giving our gifts. 
Let's come back to Vaughn. If you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it keeps me from doing what I'm supposed to do. That's how the church has been set up, friends. Each gift is kind of like a particular part of a, of a highway that the Holy Spirit travels on. So how many of you know where 422 is? Let me, let me test you out here. How many of you know where 4, come on, every hand ought to go up in this room. Yep. So think about you're traveling 422 for a minute. And imagine that as you're driving down the road, all of a sudden, a big chunk of 422 is missing. It's just not there. It's gone. How much further are you getting on your journey? Not very. Because a big piece of the road is missing. Think about the church as the highway that the Holy Spirit travels on. And every one of us make up that highway. And if one of us is missing, it affects all the rest of us. I found this picture a while ago, and I thought I'd save it because it will preach someday. How many of you have seen this picture before? Anybody seen this picture before? A few of you have seen this picture before. So this is one of those images that people that are trying to work on helping families work together will use. That if a family is is caught up in anger or fury or anxiousness and they're burning, if just one person steps out of that anger and refuses to participate, refuses to perpetuate that angry behavior, then the whole thing changes. Do you see that in the picture? Hello? So I want to trip, I want to turn it a little bit. Imagine that that first group of matches has been a group of people that's just been on fire for Jesus Christ and for His purpose in the world. And all of a sudden, one person steps away. One person isn't included or chooses not to participate. Look what happens to the rest of us, right? There's no fire there. It significantly complicates our ability to be the church. If you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it keeps me from doing what I'm supposed to do. Okay, pastor, good Bible lesson, but why is that important to me? I want you to understand something. If you've, if you've kind of put your head down or I want you to look at me, if you're online, watch me for a minute. I want every one of us to understand that God created every one of us on purpose with purpose none of us are an afterthought none of us are an accident in any way God knew exactly what he was doing when he put you together he gave you purpose well pastor what is that purpose and how do I discover it simple You surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Because see, it's only in Jesus that you're going to find your purpose. Remember what we talked about, that all the gifts flow from Jesus. All of them are rooted in Jesus. If you are willing to let go of your life and let Jesus have it, then one of the first things that Jesus does is start to help you understand why you're here and what purpose you have and what gift you have to contribute to his people. Because remember, when we connect to Jesus, he always leads us into community. Always. He never just stays with us someplace apart from his people. He leads us into connection to his people. And he helps us discern what's our part in this connection. We've been using another image, using this image of a puzzle, right? That a puzzle is just not complete when a couple of pieces are missing. And when you give your life to Jesus, He he responds to that and helps you to begin to see you are part of the puzzle and here's your piece. And the puzzle's not going to be complete if your piece is missing. Okay, Pastor, so how do I discover that piece of the puzzle that is me. I'm going to give you one simple thing to do. Here it is. 
habitually follow Jesus Christ? How many of you would say that you have some habits in your life? Oh, come on, be honest. It's Mother's Day, you can't fool her. How many of you say you got some habits in your life? How many of them are good habits? Okay, now the question. How many of you would say you got some bad habits in your life? Yeah, I thought a few more hands would go up at that point. What's a habit? Habit is something that you do over and over and over again until you don't have to think about doing it. Habitually follow Jesus Christ. Habitually. Make it your practice in every part of your life to choose to follow Jesus. When the person pulls out in front of you and you want to go, Err! Lord, am I going to respond from me? Or am I going to choose to follow Jesus? When you log on to Facebook and you see all the stuff that's on Facebook or on any other social media platform, think before you respond from your humanness. Choose to follow Jesus habitually. And when you do that, watch how Jesus begins to reveal to you who you are, what your purpose is, and where you fit in this group of people called the church. Paul said it this way. Remember, we, Alex taught us this last week. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for what? For the common good. We are all gifted. And we are gifted so that the body can be stronger. So when you came in today, you were all given a piece of, a little piece of a puzzle. I, I wanted to do this intentionally. Carmen, our media director, helped me with this. And, and this is what the puzzle looks like when all the pieces are together. And every one of you is a piece of this puzzle. If we were to get together and put our puzzle pieces together, we would we would begin to see this picture start to develop. And that's a 500-piece puzzle, and we're not quite yet 500 as a church. And so the neat thing about this is that there are still some puzzle pieces left over, which means that God's still bringing people to us, and we have work to do to go out to connect people that we need for God's ministry here in our midst. Now, I know that puzzle piece is small. It's kind of hard to find a 500-piece puzzle with puzzle pieces that big. I mean, it's it's just kind of hard. But take that puzzle piece this week and hang on to it, would you? Maybe tape it. Tape it to the refrigerator or keep it in your pocket or, I don't know, tape it to your forehead or something to just remind you that you are a piece of this puzzle called First Church. And that if your piece is missing, the puzzle's not going to be complete. This is critically important for every weekend, but as we move forward into the days to come, it's going to be more and more important that all of us are here, all of us are participating, all of us are seeking the Holy Spirit to reveal Himself to us as we chart the way forward. Dr. Larry Gilbert tells this story about a little village in France. And in the center of this little village is the church. There's a courtyard connected to the church. And in the middle of the courtyard, there is a beautiful marble statue of Jesus with his hands and his arms stretched out like this for the world. You have that picture in your mind, can you? Put that in your mind. Dr. Gilbert says, once during World War II, that little village was bombed. And a bomb went off in pretty close proximity to the statue so that the statue was shattered into a bunch of different pieces. Once the bombs stopped falling and the enemy kind of moved through, the people of the village started to look for all of the different pieces of that statue. It wasn't really a Michelangelo or it wasn't a Bernini or anything significant like that. But to them, to that village, it was critically important. It was the center of their village. And so they found the pieces and 
they put the pieces back together. And some said that the, the statue of Jesus looked better after the bombing than it did before because now Jesus bore the scars of what had happened. And when they looked at it, they saw the, this Jesus that bears our wounds and bears our scars. The only two pieces that they couldn't find to the statue were the two hands on the end of the arms of Jesus. Apparently they had been blown to such dust that they couldn't put it back together. And there was one person that said, well, this won't do. A Christ with no hands is really no Christ at all. And another person said, yeah, Jesus Hands with scars is one thing, but Jesus with no hands at all, we're going to have to get a new statue. And then a third person suggested something that the whole town got behind. The whole town thought, wow, this is a great idea. And they, they went and had a bronze plaque made, and they affixed the plaque to the bottom of the statue. And there with Jesus no hands, and scars all over him. The plaque read, I have no hands but your hands. Hmm. A few years later, another person was walking through that little village and saw that plaque. Went home and wrote this. I have no hands but your hands to do my work today. I have no feet but your feet to lead folk on the way. I have no tongue but your tongue to tell folk how I died. I have no help but your help to bring folk to God's side. Hmm. Paul said it this way. Now you are the body of Christ. And every one of you is a part of it.